Welcome to the Exploring Unschooling podcast. For countless parents, the journey to unschooling has redefined childhood and transformed their family relationships. Are you curious? Together, let's explore what living and learning looks like without school. Hello, explorers. I'm Pam Laricchia, and this is episode number 305 of the podcast. It's the 22nd of November, 2021, as I record this intro. And this week is the last installment in my mini-series in celebration of unschooling. Over these last seven episodes, I've been sharing the draft of an as-yet-unpublished book I wrote a few years ago. The book looks at unschooling through the lens of parenting, and this week we're diving into chapters 8 and 9, Childhood is Bigger Than School and the Art of Parenting. I've really enjoyed revisiting my manuscript, and I hope you've also found the series helpful wherever you are on your unschooling journey. I'd really appreciate your feedback about the book as I contemplate whether to take the next steps to publish it or to tuck it back into the drawer for now. (laughs) You can comment on the show notes page on my website. Just go to livingjoyfully.ca forward slash podcast and click on the episode at the top of the list. Or you can comment on YouTube if that's where you listen. Or you can send me a note through my contact page at livingjoyfully.ca forward slash contact. I would love to hear your thoughts. But before we get started, I want to take a moment to thank everyone who has chosen to support the podcast through Patreon. I deeply appreciate all my patrons. Your generous support pays for the hosting and transcription and contributes to the time I spend creating new episodes each week. It's instrumental in keeping the podcast archive freely available to anyone who's curious and wants to explore the fascinating world of unschooling. If you'd like to join my community of patrons and scoop up some great rewards along the way, check out the Exploring Unschooling page at patreon.com. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash exploring unschooling. And now let's dive back in and finish the book. Chapter 8. Childhood is Bigger Than School. In this book, we've been looking at the bigger picture of childhood and have seen many of the ways that the compulsory school system's short-term focus on curriculum and grades comes at the expense of our children's long-term growth and development. Even for children who are doing well at school, the messages they are absorbing will likely be detrimental to them down the road. I know they were for me. Even before high school, I was too afraid to ask questions in class for fear that the teachers and other students would discover I wasn't smart after all. I also absorbed the message that the only learning that was important was found at school. And I learned that I wasn't creative, a message that has taken years of creatively thinking through situations with my children to work through. Still, it's so easy to get caught up in our culture's myopic focus on school as a child's job and school achievement as their most important goal. Schooling, unschooling can be an excellent antidote, but what if unschooling isn't an option for your family, at least right now? Must you resign yourself to a life where your children find learning hard and boring and are so worried about being wrong that their creativity stagnates and are so busy doing what they have to do that they lose the curiosity to look up and around for more possibilities? It doesn't have to be that way, and it's completely your choice. Your children's worlds are so much bigger than school, even if school is a part of your days. You don't have to buy into the entire education system hook, line, and sinker. You can value your children and your relationships with your children over the judgment and grading that the school system advocates. You can value your children's curiosity, learning, and creativity over the content of the school curriculum. You can value your children's growing self-awareness, bigger picture perspective, and experience making choices over days filled with school, homework, and strategic extracurricular activities. Does that sound appealing? Let's see what it might look like. When school is part of your lives. There are a number of small but powerful paradigm shifts that can help you move beyond the school mindset. 
The classroom is one way to learn, but you don't need to relinquish control over your family's lives to the system as if it's the only way to learn, or give it the final say on what your children are learning. The world is bigger than school. The first shift is to see your children as whole beings. They are so much more than their grades. If you notice yourself judging your child based on their marks, take a moment to remind yourself of this. Sign the test, sign the report card, but you needn't study it in detail. Your child is still the same person, the one who's fascinated by paper airplanes or makes batches of goop to play with or takes apart your broken small appliances, no matter what their grade in science is this term or next. When you look at their lives in the bigger picture, you see that what your children learn at school becomes integrated into their overall understanding of the world alongside the stuff they pick up playing hands-on with things at home, through watching YouTube videos, and during your visits to the Science Center. As their parents, you get to see the whole picture. You see them incorporating all the things they've learned into their lives, into their language, into their choices, into their actions. That real learning means so much more in their lives than a test mark or a grade. You also see some school topics that have no real meaning in their lives come and go with little long-term learning done, and that's okay too. Even if they didn't memorize the names of all the structures in a cell, the idea that living things are made up of cells has been planted. And if they ever want to know more, they can dive in and learn more. In the bigger picture, it's not a big deal. Another shift is in the language you use at home. Ditch the school language and use real words. Drop the idea of subjects. You don't need to classify things, just talk about them. Reading a book isn't English. It's reading a book. Playing with a globe isn't geography. Maybe it's exploring what our planet looks like, or maybe it's exploring the development of civilization, or it's something else entirely. This more open perspective helps both you and your children move beyond the artificial categorization of things to the truly interconnectedness of our world. Extracurricular activities are interests. <laughs> Encourage your child to check things out because they find them interesting, full stop, not because they'd look good on a college application someday. Don't ask your children what their teacher taught them today. Ask them what they learned. Focus on the learning. Learning is as natural to humans as breathing. Your children will learn. <laughs> That's why they're absorbing so many unintended lessons from the school environment. Be careful not to value school learning over other learning. A fact or skill is not more important because it's in a curriculum. If it has value in your child's life, it has value, period. When you're chatting with your children's friends, ask them how old they are, not what grade they're in. Ask them what they enjoy doing, not what their favorite school subject is. Get the idea? Life is bigger than school. Talk about life. Now, for some kids, the classroom environment is a lousy match for their learning style. If your child clashes deeply with a school, don't try to change who your child is. Explore changing schools to find a better fit. This shows your child that you value them more than the school. Even before I discovered homeschooling even existed, my children were in two different schools. Some schools have done away with homework, at least in the earlier grades. Some specialize in areas of interest, like the sciences or arts. There are democratic schools and learning centers that don't use curriculum. It's worth looking around. Sometimes the disconnect between the child's style and the classroom's environment can lead to testing and labeling, all with the goal of getting them to fit into the classroom. Is that a useful long-term goal? Nowadays, jobs look less and less like the classroom. Different learning styles and personalities that are seen as challenges in the classroom often become strong assets out in the real world. Now, labels can sometimes be useful for searching out information, helping you and your child feel less alone and ostracized. Use that information not with an eye to fixing your child to meet some external standard, but to help them develop their personal strengths and explore ways to accommodate their weaknesses. Help them find the kinds of activities and environments that mesh with their personality and style. Help them pursue their goals. 
Rather than comparing them with others, help them understand the person they are, how they tick, and help them figure out ways to accomplish the things they want to accomplish. This deep level of self-awareness will help them in adulthood much more than spending all your energy trying to shave off their edges to fit into the school box. Sure, they'll be spending time in the classroom for now, but you can advocate for accommodations, commiserate with them over frustrations, and celebrate them in the many hours they spend outside the classroom. Let them see themselves shining in your eyes. Our world opens up when we feel good about ourselves. Open their world. Now let's take a moment to look at how school might weave into our lives from another perspective when previously unschooled children choose to go to school. Maybe they want to see what the fuss is about, an experiment of sorts. Maybe they have an interest they think school will help them explore more deeply. Maybe they are passionate about a sport and want to pursue playing professionally and getting into the high school and college system seems to be the best path. What's so interesting is how different the experience of school is when they are there by choice when the compulsory aspect of the system is eliminated. Choosing to attend school is all about using school as a tool to meet their personal goals. They take what they need and leave the rest. It's not about thumbing their nose at it at all. They jump through the hoops they need to jump through to get what they want, that perseverance or grip. If they need to keep a certain GPA or pass a certain course or whatever, they are intrinsically motivated to do so because it meets a larger personal goal. Again, it's about life, not school. And if at some point they find that school is no longer meeting their needs, they know they can withdraw with their parents' support. It's always a choice. In school or not, it's valuable to focus on relationships because not only do they last far beyond the compulsory school years, a trusting relationship helps you navigate life's challenges together. Unschooling isn't about being permissive. It's about developing a connected relationship that goes deeper than the surface level of a yes or no answer to a question or request. Why are they asking to do that particular thing? What do they hope to get out of it? If you say no, where will their thirsty mind go next? Where will it go if you say yes? If you're uncomfortable, is there a way to tweak the situation so it falls into your comfort zone? Is there a shift in perspective you can make to help stretch your comfort zone? Children, though they may lack experience, certainly don't lack depth. Their actions have motivations behind them from the earliest age. They know how to learn. You don't need to teach them. They learn quickly and deeply when they're interested. They absorb information as situations play out and incorporate that feedback into similar circumstances moving forward, just like adults learn. Homework and tests. What might our days look like when we value our children's curiosity, learning, and creativity more than the contents of the school curricula? Looking beyond test marks and grades doesn't mean we need to belittle the classroom environment in which our children find themselves. Using school as a tool means taking all the great parts and letting the parts that don't work for our children flow on by. We can continue to follow and support our children's intrinsic motivation within the school environment. The worst consequence of not making chasing grades a priority is lower grades. That's okay because we no longer define our children by their grades. On the other hand, help your children with their homework if they'd like. Chat with them about the consequences at school if they choose not to do homework, not with an eye to convincing them to do it, but to give them the information, the context that they need to make an informed choice. And choosing not to do it this week doesn't mean they'll forever make that choice. When it's not wrapped up in judgment and shame, they feel free to change their minds, making real choices based on the circumstances. Their choice is not a negative reflection on you as a parent, unless you choose to take it that way. If they have a spelling test the next day, what's more important in the big picture? Staying home that night to study or going to the park? They'll figure out how to spell those words when they have a need to write them. It doesn't need to be when they happen to show up on a spelling list. Of course, if your child wants to study, help them do that too. But you can be creative. Studying doesn't mean you need to stay home and sit at a table to do it. 
They can practice spelling the spelling the words in the car or at the park or during random pauses in the movie you're all watching. Fit these things into your lives rather than twisting your lives to fit around these things. <laughs> if your children's teachers try to make you feel bad about your children's homework record, test marks, or grades, just don't take the bait. Maybe just nod and remark, I see what you're saying, and change the subject. Or share a snippet of your perspective, giving the teacher a glimpse of your child's life outside the classroom. That's okay, I don't judge her by her grades. We went to the Science Center last weekend and she was fascinated by the human body exhibit. She's been reading about our body's organs every night since. I see her learning lots. Or last weekend we were at the art gallery and he spent ages looking at a collection of photographs taken around town 50 years ago. Whenever we have a free hour, we go to one of the spots to see what it looks like now. Or the other day we were at the park and she and her sister spent hours flying kites. They were so engaged with getting the kites in the air and keeping them up that the whole afternoon went by in a blur. Or every night for the last week, they've been trying to figure out how to get through this really, chal really challenging level in their video game. They've been reading walkthroughs, watching gameplay videos, and asking questions in a couple of forums. They've been doing so much research, it's really fun to watch. Teachers only see your child when they're at school and only for those few months they're in their classroom. You see them every day, every year. As the parent, you can more clearly see all the learning and changing and growing that they are doing year over year. That is what is valuable in your children's lives, not a grade. <clears throat> Pursuing interests and passions. There is so much life outside of school hours. Even when school is in the picture, you can spend the many hours outside the classroom focused on helping your children explore themselves and their world, rather than insisting on certain activities chosen strategically for future school success. If you don't insist on homework, studying, or calculated extracurricular activities, there is time to support your children as they engage with the world outside school. There is time to chat with them about things they see and how they feel, supporting their developing self-awareness and empathetically validating their experiences. There is more time to let them be, to let their mind wander and process, to cultivate learning and creativity. There is more time for them to navigate choices and there is more time to help them engage in their unique interests and passions. And best of all, you don't need to use judgment and shame to motivate your children. Instead, find the things they're interested in and let their intrinsic motivation sing. School definitely adds more parameters to your lives that you'll need to work around, but they aren't insurmountable. Be excited with them when they share something they learned at school or when they mention they're interested in a topic the teacher's covering. That's great. Discover what they're finding interesting and bring more of that into their lives. I don't mean more workbooks. You're not trying to bring more school home. Rather, explore with them what that topic looks like in the real world. Like any adult would pursue something they found fun and interesting. Maybe visit related attractions nearby. Search the local library and internet for more information in various formats and start in-depth discussions at home. They'll probably do well on that particular test at school, and that's a great opening to chat about how fun it is to learn about things we find interesting. And if they come across something they're interested in outside school, do the same thing. Help them explore it. All interests have value, not just the ones that happen to align with the curriculum they're covering at school right now. It's not like instead of learning the school's curriculum, they are hibernating. They are busy learning other things. If they like words, play Boggle and Bananagrams and Scrabble and words with friends, get a word of the day calendar or subscribe to one online and make a point of checking it out over breakfast or dinner. Make lists of your favorite words. Listen to fantastical audiobooks in the car. Carry a pad and pencil around with you and play hangman when you find a lull. If they like numbers, play dice games, download app games like Sudoku or 2048, check out fun activities and books by Marilyn Burns, Read children's books like G is for Google and The Number Devil. Check out the Fibonacci sequence and the Golden Ratio. Celebrate Pi Day. Learn about the lives of mathematicians. If they like logic and patterns, play Zumbinis. Play 20 questions in the car. 
puzzle out logic problems at dinner, play card games like set, have fun with fractals, pick up a set of pattern blocks and a book of tangram puzzles, leave out a big jigsaw puzzle for everyone to work on when they have a few minutes. If they like geography, hang up a big world map in the house and mark places you've been, get a talking globe and play games with it. If they like history, hang up a long roll of paper and create a historical timeline, adding the events they come across to it over time. Visit a pioneer village, a medieval dinner theater, and museums. Not all at once, though. Remember that time to be? Watch as opportunities arise in your lives. There's plenty of time. But I think you're getting the picture. Seek out things that aren't extensions of school. You can dig more deeply into what they find interesting, even as it changes over time, because you don't have a house full of 30 or so children. You have maybe a handful of children that you love and are excited to explore the world with. It is so much fun. We talked earlier about how passions can be a window to the world. Don't worry that they are closing themselves off by focusing on one thing. Instead, help them dive so deep that they encounter many different aspects of their interest. Reading, writing, analysis, and critical thinking, statistics, art, history, community, joy. It goes on and on. Helping your child explore their interests and passions is how you get to know them intimately, not through homework or test results. Many people have made lifestyle changes from small ones to seemingly drastic ones to incorporate unschooling into their lives. Things like one parent staying home full time, shift work so one parent is home at any given time, to one or both parents working from home, to bringing their child to work when needed, or their child staying with an extended family member or another family when both parents are working. And that's great. But you can start changing your relationship with your children today right now, whether or not school is in the picture. School is a tool. Use it, if needed, to your family's advantage. Don't be fooled by the drive for hive marks. That's just about college. If they eventually do want to go to college, they'll figure out a way to go to college. Maybe they'll want to go directly after high school and will choose to focus on their grades later. Maybe they'll get in with a portfolio, or maybe their lives have been so interesting that they'll get in with interviews and an essay. Maybe they'll take some time off first and then enter as a mature student. The stellar difference is going to be that they are choosing to go to college. In that situation, both the student and the college win. Or maybe college won't be a useful tool for the field they eventually discover they're interested in. Why spend 12 or more years preparing them at the cost of so much for a future that may never come to pass, a future that they can make happen if and when they want to pursue it? I love how Kaufman puts this together in his book, Ungifted. He writes, These results, along with the many others I've reviewed throughout this book, make it quite clear that people with all different kinds of minds are capable of accomplishing extraordinary things in their own way and in their own time. There's no need to pit people with different minds against each other. Why can't we value all kinds of minds without devaluing any? We can value all kinds of minds by not valuing school learning over any other kind of learning. Chapter nine, the art of being a parent. We've reached the summit of our parenting expedition. How are you doing? Let's take a few minutes to look around at the view from here. It's not a pristine view with picture-perfect trees and a babbling brook of ice-cold clear water streaming out of a crevice and meandering down the slope. It is messier, a bent tree searching out the light, a fallen log decomposing, a broken branch over the brook redirecting its flow. But it's more alive, raw beauty. Through my unschooling journey, I found that raw beauty. The beauty that every person uniquely brings to the world as they are, once we stop trying to prune them into that picture-perfect, conventionally celebrated tree. Even today, I look at my adult children and am awed by their soulful beauty, their self-awareness, their self-assuredness, their understanding of people, their active engagement with the things they find interesting, 
even though their day-to-day -day lives look very different. Their roots are strong. What does your parenting mindset look like from here? Does it look beyond the 18-year window of legal responsibility? When we look at our children's lifetime, the compulsory school years, they're such a small part of that. So why would we spend our years with them so focused on chasing school success? Look at life instead. As parents, is our goal to raise good students? I like to think of them as people instead. And with a hundred odd years of school history to draw on, it's more obvious than ever that school success does not guarantee a lifetime of success, however you define it. And how do we define success anyway? I think that's a very personal question with a wide range of answers, not the one size fits all conventional definition of climbing the corporate ladder to more power and money. In her book, The Top, Ty the Top Five Regrets of the Dying, Bronnie Ware, who worked in palliative care with patients who had returned home to die, talks about their most common regrets and the failure to advance further at their job or make more money was nowhere to be seen. In fact, one of them was, I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life others expected of me. That idea lies at the root of unschooling, helping our children explore and live a life true to themselves, not the expectations of others. How valuable do you feel a curious mindset is? Are you a curious sort? I suspect curiosity played a role in your choice to read this book. What are your interests? Do you feel this is a trait you'd like to nurture in your children? If so, pay attention to those moments when you're feeling tempted to shut it down. Can you find the patience to support their exploration instead? Being curious about our world encourages us to stay engaged in our lives, actively living them rather than letting them happen to us. And what about learning? Does it seem worthwhile to look at learning as a lifelong endeavor rather than the work of childhood? I hope throughout the book you've caught glimpses of how living and learning are intimately connected when you're not relying on a curriculum to tell you what you should know. The world is so much bigger and brighter. It's pieces so much more interconnected than a curriculum can hope to mimic. Did it make sense how the classroom environment teaches children that learning is hard? That's one of those alien features that so often distinguishes unschooling children. For them, learning is fun. It happens almost incidentally as they sink into the flow of pursuing their interests and passions. If your children go to school, you can still see it if you stop expecting all the learning to look like school learning and you help your children dive into whatever they find interesting rather than trying to redirect them to pursuits you deem worthwhile. Remember, even the most passionate interests can be an expansive window to the world. And the intrinsic motivation to chase goals of their own making is off the charts amazing. With curiosity driving learning and that learning building a wealth of experiences, we come to the third leg of the unschooling stool, creativity. While our society values creativity in adults, the messages received during a conventional childhood seem determined to squash it. There is only one right answer, do what adults tell you without question, stay inside the box, don't be too different, don't be lazy, keep busy. Time to think and be is so valuable for both children and adults. It is in those introspective moments that new and creative connections are made and deeper insights into existing knowledge are developed. In our productivity crazed culture, we are desperately shortchanging ourselves. No wonder creativity has become so rare. Instead, cultivate it in your children and yourself. Take the time to think of a half dozen potential solutions to a problem or issue you face, whether it be artistic or mundane. The first handful will be stereotypical, but then you'll be faced with digging deeper into the ideas that are uniquely yours. That's the idea behind James Altucher's suggestion to make a list of 10 ideas every day, which he talks about in his book, Choose Yourself, and give your children the time and space to do that too. It was such a beautiful surprise to me how intricately curiosity, learning, and creativity are woven together. Remember, even if school is part of your days, the rest of your lives need not move at a similarly stilted and steady pace. 
take the time to invite creativity in. What did you think when our parenting expedition stepped into the landscape of character? Did it make sense that developing character happens less through teaching and more through living? And not just in the living itself, but in the thinking and processing of experiences, in the free-flowing conversations we have with our children. Did the realization that we all grow and change over our lifetime strike you as important? Gaining experience with all the ways we can engage with our days helps us develop a sense of self-awareness that no behavior modification techniques can hope to achieve. Understanding how we tick is such a strong foundation for our ongoing exploration of the person we want to be and for understanding and empathizing with the perspectives of others. It is also wrapped into the strong intrinsic motivation we have for pursuing our own goals and aspirations, which in turn underlies the adaptability and grit that unschoolers often display. It's all about being free to choose what they do. You can't teach such steely determination, but you can help your children find the things that they are determined to pursue. Quitting is not about failure or about giving up. It's about learning more about ourselves as they search for those things. Then our expedition turned inward toward creating a safe and trusting family environment in which this individualized learning and growing can thrive. I know these ideas can seem quite alien through a conventional parenting lens, but I hope they made some sense to you. Could you begin to envision what life might look like if you choose not to cultivate a power-based adult-child dynamic? Did it seem reasonable to look at fair from the child's perspective? When you're meeting each child's real needs, no matter how different your actions may be, they each feel understood and taken care of, equally loved. And when you want to connect with your child, don't pull them to you, go to them. It is in their space with their beloved activities where you'll see them shine and get to know them intimately. If they don't yet welcome you in, be patient, pay attention, make small connections with them over the things they love, not the things you wish they'd love. Stop trying to convince them how cool your vision of your perfect child is and celebrate the real and wonderful child in front of you. Sometimes the unschooling lifestyle can seem a bit utopian when someone first reads about it, but are you getting a glimpse at how, although unschooling parents don't put any barriers in their children's way and do their best to help them navigate those that appear, life is still full filled with twists and turns. Is yours? Because mine is. (laughs) My children's have been and continue to be. I don't need to create any artificial hardships for them to experience that life isn't fair. In fact, I suspect that only parents who are making their children's lives artificially easy consider that necessary. Don't simulate life for your children. Live it together. Another fascinating realization for me has been just how much the pace of change in our lives has been increasing, even in just the last few decades. My children's childhood years looked remarkably different than mine, unschooling notwithstanding. In this new world that contains a vast sea of information readily available to anyone with an internet connection and even just a phone, memorizing and regurgitating facts for a test has even less value than it ever did. Not to mention, pretty much the only facts and skills that stay with students long-term are those that they actually use in their days. The rest fades from memory. Rather than spending so much time memorizing and forgetting the curricula contents, what if our children spent their time learning the things they find so interesting that they'll actually be remembered? Sure, the knowledge and skills they gather over the years won't reflect the school's curriculum exactly, and maybe not even closely, but it will reflect each child's unique view of the world. And it is the threads of those personal interests and passions that will weave into their adult lives. The roots of their days, pursuing their goals and aspirations, don't change from childhood to adulthood, even as the content of their days may change drastically. Their curiosity, lifelong perspective on learning, and creative approach to challenges come together in ways that will serve them well over their lifetime. And then our expedition entered new territory. 
Taking our new perspective on childhood, how all learning is valuable, how useful it is to cultivate curiosity and creativity rather than shaming our children with an eye to keeping them in the conventional box, and how character development can't be effectively taught but needs to be experienced, we took a fresh look at school. I learned so much about learning, parenting, and childhood through unschooling my own children, yet I eventually realized that much of what I learned was bigger than school. Although conventionally, school is considered a child's work and most important aspect of their childhood years, you don't have to buy into that perspective. Even if school is a necessary parameter in your lives right now, that does not mean it has to take over your life. You can use school as a tool, as a supplementary provider of information for your children, some of which they'll find interesting and engaging, and some of which they'll soon forget, and that's okay. Does that seem like an unorthodox perspective to take? Well, remember, only you see your children every day, every month, every year. You see them deeply engaged in the things they personally find interesting. You see them incorporating the things they've learned into their vocabulary, their actions, their choices. And with strong, connected, and trusting relationship, you more intimately know and understand your child than even the most dedicated teacher overseeing a class of 30-odd students for 10 months. Trust yourself. Unschooling isn't about being a different path to raising a conventionally successful adult. It's about living wholeheartedly with your children, active partners in each other's lives, connection and trust and love weaving through the ins and outs and ups and downs of your days. Children are not empty vessels to be filled. They are born curious and creative with a deep thirst to learn about and engage with their world. They learn the same way adults learn. They don't need to be sequestered away in adult-led school and extracurricular activities taught, tested, and graded. They can learn about themselves and the world by living in the world. When we began unschooling, I had no idea what was in store for me. It has been an incredibly eye-opening experience. Children are real people, not adults in training. And seeing the world through their eyes brought color and joy back to my world. My concept of childhood has been completely redefined. And now that we've reached the end of our expedition, whatever parenting path you choose to take with your children, I hope that those of us who have chosen unschooling just seem a little less alien and that the next time you watch your children at play, you smile a bit more. I hope you found this episode helpful on your unschooling journey. And be sure to check out the growing podcast archive. The conversations never go out of date. You can find more information about my books, the Living Joyfully Network online community, and the Childhood Redefined Unschooling Summit online course at my website, livingjoyfully.ca.